At last ready for bed, I cleared my drawings from the kitchen table. It was late, but this was the only time I had for myself to draw and to dream about my life beyond the shuttle. The fire father had made in the parlor hearth to warm our little house had collapsed to embers. The wood stove had also gone out, giving off irregular ticks as it cooled. The kitchen had a faint aroma of this evening's cabbage soup and beans. A draft from a crack in the floorboards scattered a small puff of stove ash. Outside, the howl of a Lithuanian winter wind banged against a loose shutter so loudly I feared it would wake the family. As the oldest child, I had the responsibility to make sure the house was safe before I went to bed. As I opened the window to fasten the shutter, a rush of icy air blew into the house and scattered sparks from the hearth, setting the drapes and furniture on fire. Soon the fire, like a panicked animal, was in a hundred places at once. I rushed upstairs and roused father. He told me to wait with mother until he woke brother and sister. After all of us were safely outside, wrapped in blankets, father went back into the fire and rescued our Torah. For the rest of my life I treasured that holy book and revered my father, who I thought was one of God's angels. But the flames and the cold had left their mark. As soon as I grew to a man, the panic feeling of a dream was always the same. Father stands silent, motionless and burning in the flames, but shielding the Torah with his prayer shawl. I awake with crushing shame and a terror of fire and of ice. When I was a young man, I studied art in Europe, returned home, and trained with some of the best painters and lithographers in New York. But my youthful art was almost totally about social justice. It's easy to understand why. When I saw father handcuffed by czarist police and sent to prison with no trial, I was just a kid. As the police dragged father through the snow, the last words he shouted to us were, Go to America! After we moved to New York, Father escaped prison and found us in our Brooklyn apartment. Words can't describe my feeling of opening the door and seeing Father in filthy clothes, hat in hand, and head bowed in shame. When he raised his eyes to mine, he formed an uncertain smile that faded to a frown. Father! I screamed. Throwing my arms around him, I could smell his years of torment. My young man's strong embrace startled him, and holding him at arm's length, I saw a smile return to his face. Father said he had been charged with subversive activity, but the Tsar's men had given him no details. Luckily, along with other prisoners, he had tricked the guards and escaped. His return to our family put feeling into what, until then, had only been childish thoughts about justice. In the 1920s, when the Sacco and Vanzetti case was to me a clear case of injustice, I painted their portrait. It was the strongest political statement of my career, and the first time I had put so much strong feeling into a painting. It hurt me when critics dismissed the work as propaganda, but my wounded ego taught me that true art is heartfelt and means risking rejection. I never forgot that. During the Great Depression, I married Bernarda Bryson. Everyone called her Bernie. She and I struggled, like all artists in New York. We saw what happens when capitalism collapses under its own greed. We saw injustice writ large on the city, the proliferation of bread lines and apple sellers on the street. Somewhat embarrassed to say it now, but at the time, we thought the daily count of Park Avenue suicides of greedy capitalists must be punishment by God's own wrath. But Bernie and I would be astonished how much more injustice there was west of the Hudson. Many rural people flocked to the cities, thinking it was still possible to squeeze out a living. But city dwellers left their apartments and literally walked south, thinking they could live off the land in a warmer climate. Both were dead wrong. A few months after our marriage, 
an unexpected trip into the American South would confront us with poverty and human suffering beyond our comprehension. New York was nothing compared to what we saw. We would feel helpless in the face of such godforsaken misery. Before our trip south, I was a naive young man, full of today's social causes and unfocused moral outrage. But I found it difficult to draw scenes of squalor like in the photos Jacob Rees took of the Bowery. Everything I encountered walking the sidewalks of Manhattan aggrieved me. The poverty, of course, but also the endless con games. I never felt any kind of redeeming value or moral uplift in anything I saw. It was also tawdry. Everyone was either stealing your money or begging for it. But after weeks of walking and getting nowhere, I made several paintings the critics labeled social realism, but my paintings were not protest art. I didn't particularly care what people were doing. I just got pleasure from looking into their faces. There was this group of blind musicians performing on Union Square. I loved sketching them, but sometimes they moved around and that made drawing difficult, so I came up with the idea to photograph them and look at the prints later on as a guide to my painting. This became my basic approach. I decided I should no longer get caught up in social causes, but try to reveal the faces of the people hurt by injustice. Before marriage, I lived in a studio with Walker Evans. Now, he was a well-known photographer, and I was, I guess you could say, up and coming. I got my first camera from my brother, who loaned me the money for it. I told him, if I didn't get a magazine photograph on the first roll, I'd give him the camera back. That sounded like a pretty good deal to him. The problem was, I didn't know what to do with a camera. So I asked Walker, Walker, how do you use this thing? And he said, well, I'll show you sometime. But that time never came, and I just walked around New York trying to do my best. And then Walker got this invitation to go to Havana to take photographs, and I said, as I was pushing his bag into the cab, Hey, Walker, how about that lesson in photography? With one foot in the cab and one on the curb, he said to me, Look, Ben, all you gotta remember is F28 on the shady side of the street and F45 on the sunny side. Set it for 125th of a second, hold it steady, and there you go. And that's really the only photography lesson I ever had. Now, one of the advantages of getting old is that you remember absolutely everything from your early life in great detail. Looking back at myself in my early twenties, what I saw was a very aggressive, idealistic young man walking around New York City with a camera trying to earn a living with socially meaningful photographs and paintings. I was the stereotype of the starving artist, always worried about where my next commission would come from. I put any money I had toward paying my debts, so I never got ahead. Then along came the Great Depression, and it all got very scary. America was simply collapsing. When I saw school children scavenging in trash cans, I became fearful I wasn't going to make it, and that some winter I would freeze to death in my bed. But, in 1935, Franklin Roosevelt saved us. Walker Evans started working for the government as a photographer, and he actually recommended me. Then I got the call to come down to Washington and to start working as a painter, propagandist, and sketch artist. I looked at Barney in disbelief. This job would mean financial stability and food on the table. There are no words for how good we felt. About as happy as we were about having money and food... We had no idea this new job would require us to meet American citizens living in despair, starvation, and squalor. We would live day to day with our bellies full and clean clothes on our backs, avoiding the eyes of hungry children and even hungrier parents. We would observe the worst of America's greatest social and economic injustice, powerless to help. Just days after our marriage in 1935... Bernie and I met in Washington with Mr. Rexford Togwell, a New Deal administrator and agricultural expert. He said he wanted me to paint propaganda posters for President Roosevelt's resettlement administration. Holding a pipe tight in his teeth and with a wave of prematurely white hair, Togwell was an intimidating man who easily struck an air of self-importance. 
He also seemed touchy and pressed for time when he said, Mr. Sean, you can't possibly do what we're asking until you go see for yourself what the depression is doing to people. I knew he hoped the trip would convince me to take the government's side in their campaign to reverse the depression. But I was in no position to debate politics with him, so I signed up. After all, I had never been west of the Hudson. What did I really know about America? But I was confident I could come to my own conclusions. Tugwell knocked his pipe sharply on an ashtray and filled it. Blowing out a fresh plume of smoke and looking into the middle distance, he finally met my eyes and ticked off his points. The government will provide a car and pay a salary and expenses for you and your wife. I want you to see the resettlement communities where the government is moving indigent people from shacks into brand new houses. At first blush, all this seemed like a great, humane idea. But I knew big social programs were never that simple. Tugwell put his hand on my shoulder and looked right at me. I first want you to head down to Arthurdale. Now, Mrs. Roosevelt is real keen on Arthurdale. She's even putting up her own money to make sure it works. How do the people like these new homes, I asked. They'll like them just fine, Mr. Sean, Tugwell blurted. Your job is to get some images showing how much they do like them. Tugwell turned back toward his desk, raised his hand, and we knew we had been dismissed. Walking out of the office, Bernie asked, What do you think Tugwell meant when he said Mrs. Roosevelt was going to make sure Arthurdale works? I guess we'll see, was all I could say. But her question troubled me. Even though the encounter with Tugwell had disturbed us, at that moment I tried to put aside my growing doubts about the trip. This was no time to quibble, and after all this was to be a honeymoon at government expense. I also wanted us to succeed as artists and looked forward to our little adventure. I was able to change my mood by thinking about filling up my sketch pad with fresh art ideas. But more importantly, I would enjoy using the camera skills I had honed in New York. On our trip, maybe the camera would become more important to me. I started to think photography might be what I should be doing with the rest of my life, and I was excited to find out. On a hot day in early October, we motored south to Morganton, West Virginia, and eventually arrived in Arthurdale. When we got there, we saw neat rows of government-built houses, pretty dull to look at and offering no opportunity to shoot pictures. We saw people moving in, so Bernie turned the car into a driveway and I got out. Where are you from? I asked. A man turned his head toward me and replied, Scott's Run. He hesitated and asked, Hey, mister, do you know how to open the front door? It's locked. I told him sorry, we were just passing through, and to ask one of his new neighbors or to check with the administrator in the big building at the end of his street. And once we found out where Scott's Run was, and that it wasn't too far, Bernie and I headed out. I had noticed the guy didn't look too happy. All his belongings were scattered on the lawn, and the family looked lost and frozen, unsure of what to do next. We thought it strange new arrivals would be so poorly prepared to move in. In preparation for our trip, Tugwell had asked me to read relevant portions of J. Russell Smith's North America. Smith notes that Scott's Run is a five-mile-long valley sitting atop some of the richest coal seams in the world. During World War I, Scott's Run experienced an economic boom. Everyone was employed and wages were high. Following the war, the price of coal plummeted and unemployment rose. Large boring machines replaced the human labor of pickaxe and shovel. Long before the Great Depression, the coal industry was in a major decline. In fact, the people in West Virginia and eastern Kentucky hardly noticed the Great Depression. There were no actual roads into Scott's Run. Instead, rutted logging paths led into the camp. I worried with all the bouncing on the deep ruts our car would break a spring, stranding us two hundred miles from Washington. With careful shifting and braking, Bernie got us in. The children noticed us first and swarmed the car. 
They followed us as we moved slowly along the main road, riding the running board and pressing their faces against the window glass. Even though the fall weather was hot, we had rolled up the windows against the clouds of dust that, like the children, followed us in. The locals had built the town along a single dirt street. I guessed a hard rain would make it a sea of mud. There was a shuttered bank, a coal company grocery with no visible customers, a clabbered building with a hand-lettered sign that said Holiness Mission, and a stable with a blacksmith pumping a forge. When we drove past the little town into the camp where people lived, Bernie and I saw a railroad track running next to a creek. Houses, just shacks, really, rose on wooden stilts as a guard against the flooding of the creek. Dingy wash hung on lines stretched between the houses. Clutched in heavy tangles of muscadine, outhouses stood next to the shacks. Small rivulets of sewage streamed down the embankment from the outhouses to the creek, and garbage littered the hillside. The locals explained that during rainy months, high water carried the waste downstream and cleansed the town, but during summer they just tolerated the stink. Bernie noticed that nothing escaped the black dust not even the leafless chinaberry trees holding fast to their yellow fall berries. After only an hour, our faces, hands, and clothing were covered with black soot. But worse was the air. We could not breathe without a burning in our throat and a chemical taste. When we asked the kids about the air, they said the coal and rock brought out of the mines were separated at the coal tipple into a slag heap. The small amount of waste coal in the slag catches fire when exposed to air and burns continuously, producing the bitter fumes. While I talked to the men, Bernie went off to find the children. Presently she returned with a ghastly expression. She took my hand and led me away from the men. Ben, these children live in rags. They have no shoes and look small for their age. I met a twelve-year-old girl who looked seven or eight. Bernie paused and inhaled deeply before going on. I asked the girl what happened to her fingers. Several of them were short and clubby. Completely matter-of-fact, she said the rats chew the fingers of the babies at night. The babies cry but can't fight them off. The rats don't bother the children older than two or three. Many of the kids Teeth are missing and rotting, and their eyes have a vacant look. It's just beyond imagining. When the parents found out we wanted to take pictures, they called the children home for a scrubbing and a change into Sunday clothes. It was only after we took the children's pictures that the adults shed their suspicions and allowed us free reign to roam the town. Later in the afternoon, several people invited us to a prayer meeting. Bernie and I looked at each other. We both knew we weren't going to tell them we were Jews. It was at the prayer meeting we understood how the people of Scots Run felt about the place they lived and their resentment of Arthurdale. Part prayer meeting, part seminar for us, the church was packed. The minister, Billy Ray Justice, was a small, unassuming man, his face seemed heavy with the sadness of an unbelieving world. The church, festive with conversation and good feeling, was hot and crowded. Children and a group of five young men sang Amazing Grace. Neighbors shook hands and squeezed shoulders. The man next to me explained Billy Ray was minister because God had given him a special mark. Lightning hit Billy Ray one time and left a scar on his forehead the shape of a cross. The crowd grew quiet when Billy Ray stood up. We are the Lord's children. Blessed be the Lord Jesus. Amen, said the people. Pray with me, brothers and sisters. The people bowed their heads. Today, we are privileged to have Mr. Roosevelt's man visiting us. Bless him, O Lord, that he may go back to Washington with our message. 
a message from our little town and its blessed hollers. Amen, said the people. Gathering himself, Billy Ray kindled his heart with a swelling fire. Our fathers and mothers and our parents before them mined and worked this land. Open Mr. Roosevelt's heart, O oh Lord. Tell him not to take us from our land, cause we have a right to be here. We pray in Jesus' name, our Lord. Amen, said the people. Billy Ray launched into his sermon. He waved his arms and strode up and down the boards with fervor in his heart and sweat staining his shirt. He looked directly at me several times and said the homes of Scott's Run were sacred places where babies were born, sick children nursed to health, and old people died in peace. He didn't want the townspeople transferred to Arthurdale. In fact, several families had returned. They wanted homes, not houses, he said. A few months ago, Eleanor Roosevelt had brought shame to the town when she brought in a potential donor who wandered around the camp and actually went into one of their homes. He came out and loudly told the First Lady, Ma'am, I will give you anything you want for this here camp. Just don't make me go back into them shacks. When the prayer meeting broke up, we said goodbyes and headed for the car. Mr. Justice caught up with us and put his hand on my shoulder. Ben, why don't you and Bernie stay the night with me and the missus? You can leave tomorrow. The roads be a mite tricky at night. I caught the panic in Bernie's eye and begged off, saying we were on our way to Arkansas and needed to get an early start. I had thoughts of an evening being deluged with more talk about Mr. Roosevelt. Billy Ray seemed genuinely disappointed. Well, Ben, what you looking for, then? We want to see if the government's treating people fairly with this resettlement program, how people feel about it, I said. That's right, Ben. You don't have to go far to see what's right under your nose. Your journey show you the same suffering everywhere. Only difference will be what's happening in your heart. Just ask yourself, what's the best way to help suffering people? Pulling them out of their homes? or leaving them be to find their own way. The Unimiss is going down to Arkansas now, but keep your eyes open and be careful. Bowing his head, he put his hand on my shoulder. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and rain fall softly on your path. Until we meet again, may the Lord hold you in the palm of his hand. We embraced. Then, giving an extra squeeze on my shoulder, Billy Ray walked away. Driving back to Morganton, we felt a flood of feeling. In the cool, late afternoon sunlight, Dry leaves blew into our open windows and danced in front of the car, dappling the road before us. We bumped along and thought about the people we had met. They were poor, but extremely proud. According to them, many private organizations, including the Quakers, had come into the camp to help, but the adults were not interested in help for themselves. They let the Quakers feed the children. Bernie, tears filling her eyes, asked me, What are we going to do about this, Ben? I feel so guilty, these poor people. Why didn't we want to stay the night with Billy Ray and his wife? Why did we refuse their hospitality? Are we that spoiled and citified? I couldn't answer. Arriving after dark, we checked into a motor court and rushed to clean the soot from our clothes and our bodies. We lay in bed, tired, but still eager for more talk about the day. We puzzled over why people wouldn't want to move from shacks to new houses with modern conveniences. Bernie said she thought the people of Scott's Run simply had a strong pride of place. They put great value in their ancestral home. 
I fell asleep wondering if Mrs. Roosevelt would ever understand why the people of Scott's Run hated her Arthur Dale so much. The First Lady would learn that helping people often had unintended consequences. There had to be a way to help people without taking away their freedom to choose where they live. That night my fire dream returned. Father holds the Torah. Flames lick at his feet. Now there is a baby blanketed in a bassinet on the table next to him. A rat circles the baby, ignoring the flames. The fire consumes the table, collapsing in a smoky rubble. The rat, still indifferent to the fire, jumps onto the blanket and, nostrils flaring, smells the baby. Eyes wide open, the baby gurgles a happy and contented sound muted by the roar of the fire and reaches for the rat. I awoke, feeling anxious and covered in sweat. Bernie said she was worried I had slept so poorly. I was in a sullen mood until we walked outside to the restaurant where we would have breakfast. It was such a bright, clear morning I didn't want to spoil the mood by telling Bernie about the rat. As my thoughts cleared, I simply told her I was worried about the people of Scott's Run. They clearly were in a great deal of pain, and there was nothing the two of us could do about it. They seemed to cherish something we could not see and to cling to an unspoken ancient promise of nurture and life from their beloved mountains. As an artist, I owed them my best effort to photograph what we had seen. I held out the hope my photographs would convey a message to Mrs. Roosevelt. Really, that's all we could have done, but I wasn't sure she would ever see them. As Bernie drove us out of town, I spoke about how something inside me had changed. I decided to tell her about my dream this time with the rat and about how I struggled to make sense of it. One thing was certain. In past dreams, I had always felt guilty about starting the fire that destroyed our home in Lithuania. But last night the feeling was different. The rat had made me angry, and Billy Ray's blessing had touched me. I now saw how much I owed the people of Scott's Run for teaching me the value of their blessing and their hospitality. They had captured our feelings and wouldn't let go. My art, up to that point, had been a struggle with big social issues and protest, that sort of thing. I decided years ago not to get drawn into social protest painting, but to stay focused on the people hurt by injustice. But at Scott's Run... I felt pulled back into protest and rage. I realized the rat had done this to me. That had to be the reason. But Billy Ray's tender blessing and hospitality renewed my commitment to people. I would paint and photograph people with important stories written on their faces. A measure of peacefulness then returned to me, and I turned to look at Bernie. She said nothing just nodding as she let me go on. I told her in my heart I knew from now on I could commit my art to needy people only by refusing to get caught up in politics, by resisting the urge to rage against injustice. To do that, I would have to take the risk of getting close to people and earning their trust. Only then would they show me their feelings. Only then would my art have real value. But doubt nagged me. How much could my art really help them? In Arkansas, I found the answer. I could feel my blood surge as the car picked up speed. I was so excited I could barely keep a single thought in my head. There was a long silence. Then Bernie glanced at me with the clearest love in the whole world, smiled, and pointed the car south toward Kentucky, Tennessee, and Arkansas. As we set off for a brand new adventure, it felt so good to be on the road with the wind blowing on our faces. We stopped in the little town of Huntington, Tennessee, 
where that afternoon there was going to be a medicine show. The sign announcing the show was covered in red, white, and blue bunting. Slowing the car, Bernie squinted at the small letters near the bottom. See a man eat a live chicken. Oh, my God, was all she said. There really wasn't that much hoopla in town when we parked and started to walk around. A small crowd of men joked and smoked fat cigars, teasing a little negro boy dressed for a minstrel show just getting underway. A white man dressed as an Indian chief sold bottles of a brown liquid to other white men, promising them greater manly vigor. I recalled Mark Twain noting the folks living along the Mississippi were gullible. <laughs> From what I could see, he was right. The crowd moved toward a small sign announcing the live chicken eating at 1 p.m. I asked a man standing next to me if he had ever seen a man eat a live chicken. Quite easy once you see it, he said, and then looked expectantly toward the crowd, making sure the festivities hadn't started. Get your hen. Rooster's too tough. All you do is take the bird in your hands, look straight into its eyes, kind of hypnotize it. Then as quick as a snake, you bite the chicken's head clean off with your teeth. Bernie turned away and walked toward the car, but I was captured and stayed to hear the rest of the story. Without missing a beat, the man went on. Then when the blood starts to squirt out, some people drink it, others just let it run on the ground. Then he takes your chicken and pulls back his skin with your hands and eats the breast meat. Without his head, the chicken makes jerky motions, looks like he's still alive. That's really all there is to it. I thanked the man and followed Bernie to the car. As Bernie put the car in gear, all she said was, Oh, my God! I told her I had learned a new word. What we were now going to do was skedaddle. <laughs> That's right, time to skedaddle, she said. We headed across the bridge to Arkansas. The paved roads gave way to dirt roads, and again we were bouncing our way past farms and groups of workers waiting to pick cotton. A sign read, Redemption, Five Miles. We smiled at the sign and pushed on, thinking we were heading for an actual town. But Redemption was only a small cluster of shacks. The adults and children wore filthy rags made from flour sacks, and after talking with the people, it became clear there was nothing you could do for them in the usual ways. If you gave them money, they had no place to spend it, and wouldn't have a way to get somewhere to spend it. The better off had a car, but most didn't. But everywhere I pointed my camera was a picture. Once we said Mr. Roosevelt had sent us, the people relaxed and let me shoot. Bernie spent time asking about the children— where they went to school, what they ate. I continued my new practice of focusing on faces, trying to capture the individual and what they were feeling. I asked questions about what they did every day on the farm, how many chickens they had, or how they dealt with sick animals. At first they seemed put off by my northern accent, but I was able to find comfortable rapport quickly. These were real folks without the pretense of city people. When they invited us into their homes, I knew we would find out something important about their lives. But I would discover something important about my life, too. Being an artist is not just passively observing people. Being an artist of any worth requires intimacy and trust on both sides of the camera. I believe you're on sacred ground when you're inside a home, so you need to show respect. The respect I showed was not using a flash. Flash destroys everything. Without the flash, you can capture the high-contrast lighting so beloved by the ancient painters. Look at those newspapers pasted on the walls. Look at the glistening oil lamps or the soft shadows on the faces of the schoolchildren. I now know I took a great portrait when I could see a person's inner life written on his face. But that photograph won't happen without mutual respect. You see, respect comes from accepting how little you know about people. Photograph a person where he feels the most comfort, and the portal to his inner life will open. In the homes where they are loved and shielded from their fears, 
in the schoolrooms where they delight each day in the joy of new learning, and in the sanctuaries where they pray and feel the bond of community. When I learned to see what these folks had, rather than what they didn't have, they felt my respect. In return, they welcomed us like family. Mrs. Lancaster asked if we could please speak to her grandfather Jasper dying in the bedroom. She said he just needed to see a fresh face and that might revive him. At first I hesitated, but Bernie marched right in with her. I followed behind the two women and stood at the foot of the bed until the old man beckoned for me with outstretched arms and motioned for me to sit next to him on the bed. After I introduced myself, he looked me in the eye, squeezed my hand, and spoke in a surprisingly strong voice. Mr. Ben, can you see the pain in my eyes? Just you sit and listen to while this dream I've had all my life. It torments me so. I want you to help me so I don't die with shame in my heart. Jasper gripped me so tight his hands turned pale. I see my burning house and hear my little baby girl Alice crying inside, but I can't get to her. The heat's so strong. The wind blows the flame so bad he sucks out my breath. I just stand there until her crying stops. Jasper heaved a sob that caught in his throat. It, it just makes me feel so bad. Tears filled our eyes, and Jasper looked straight at me with a faint smile. His grip loosened as life left him. Bernie sat down behind me on the bed and put her arms around my neck. She whispered in my ear, I love you, Ben Sean. Be at peace now. These rooms are holy places of birth, of sickness, and of death. Images do not capture the sanctity of these spaces, and only briefly let the light reveal the dignity of those faces. With each season of frost and heat, a story is told twice. For the child and for the man, the shadows and the light will hide the fear of fire and of ice.